Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about p-values. We always hear in statistical studies that either the p-value is less than 0.05, so we have evidence, or the p-value is greater than 0.05, so we don't have evidence, but what is this actually saying? Where is this number coming from? So a p-value is actually the probability that something is occurring by chance. So we can, for example, have flipping a coin. So when you flip a coin, your chances are you either have heads or you have tails. Say we're going to flip a coin 15 times. So in the upper left-hand corner, it says repeat 15 times. And this, by the way, is just a simulation on tinker plots. So if we flip a coin 15 times, we see the first flip we have tails, second flip tails, third flip heads, and it repeats this 15 times and records this data for you. We can then go to the next chart where it kind of splits it up how many times we have tails and how many times we have heads. So we got tails six times and heads nine times in just this one replication. But this one replication won't show you exactly that you're gonna get heads 50% of the time and tails 50% of the time because that's not always going to happen. So we can then replicate this a thousand times. So then overall you can see about how many times we'll get. So say this is just showing the 610th replication. We got seven heads, therefore eight tails. We're just recording the amount of heads in this case. And the 611th replication, we have eight heads. We can then put this on an overall graph and you can see like number seven and eight heads rolling over 15 times occurs more frequently, which you would expect. And out of a thousand times, we only got heads one time, two different circumstances. And overall, this looks relatively like a normal distribution, which we would expect. Um, for an example, to actually c collect a p-value from this data, say we have a woman who gets in a car accident and she says that she has complete numbness in her left arm and she's trying to sue the person, the company's car that hit her, but these people aren't just gonna give her the money. They wanna know that she actually has numbness in her left arm. So they do a test where they blindfold her and they're gonna either put one or two fingers on her arm and they're gonna tell her when they're touching her arm and she has to tell them if they're placing one or two fingers. If she co has complete numbness in her arm, not, she's not gonna be able to know whether there's one or two fingers touching her, so she'd be completely guessing. And if you're guessing, you would assume you have 50% chance of getting it correct or 50% chance of getting it incorrect, which is why we set the spinner up this way. And they asked her 100 questions. So if we repeat this trial one time and then repeat that a thousand times, you would clearly expect her to get, you know, between the range of 48 and 54 questions correct if she's purely just guessing. Well, it happens to turn out that she only got 30 questions correct. So we're trying to see as if she is intentionally saying the wrong answer, that she actually knows what the amount of fingers touching her? I yes. have a question. You said that she got asked a hundred times? Yes. But there's a lot more than a hundred dots up there. Yes, so she, like, you asked her one a hundred questions, and then, so by chance, you would expect 50 questions to get correct. This is repeating that process a thousand times. Okay, so repeating the 100 thing. A thousand times. Okay. I'm Does that you. make sense? Yep, I'm with you. Okay. So, just like the heads versus tails example. So she only answered 30 questions correct, which we don't even see along the bottom there, because by chance, answering 30 questions correct out of 100 didn't even happen by chance. So therefore, 30 questions and below did not happen at all. So to get your p-value, it would be zero over a thousand would be the probability that that was happening by chance, which is clearly less than our 0.05 cutoff, which is just an accepted value by statisticians. But what if she, oops, what if she answered 
more than 30 questions correct, would we still have evidence that she was intentionally answering incorrectly? And the answer is yes, because if she answered all the way up to 41 questions incorrect, the probability of that happening by chance would still be less than 5%. Um, so this type of test we would call a left tail test. In this case, our critical value would be the 30 questions that she answered correctly, and then we're measuring everything from 30 questions correct all the way down to zero. We could flip this around the other way, where we're measuring the total number of questions she answers incorrectly. So since she answered 30 questions correctly, she answered 70 incorrectly. And again, we don't see 70 on the chart at all, which would still give us a p-value of zero. And just in that square too, you can see that if she answered 60 questions incorrectly or above, we would still have that range that she was, we had evidence she was, or she was actually answering incorrectly on purpose, which matches up with the 40 correct or 60 incorrect. And this would constitute as a left or a right tailed test. And we also have um, a two-tailed test, which is if you're just trying to find a difference in the two. And when you're actually doing a statistical test, you're not going to be performing um, these replications a thousand times and doing a simulation. The statistical software will basically do that for you. But this is what it's doing behind the scenes, and then it'll give you a list you can choose right tail, left tail, or both sides on the output. Are there any questions? All right.